Uh, cardiac output, oh, like what is it in a normal person? Um, healthy young men, 5.6 liters. Healthy young women, 4.9. Why the difference? Difference in body mass. Okay, that's all. Um, you ladies, you have less mass to supply blood to, so you get to have a less, less of a cardiac output. So the cardiac output is the amount of blood which enters the aorta per minute. Now, you're going to ask, well, what about the right-sided circulation? It should also be the amount of blood that enters the uh, right or in, enters the pulmonary artery. Okay, remember the right side and left side should be pumping about the same amount of blood each time. Otherwise, you have heart failure. Um, so it's also the amount of blood that flows through the circulation, so end to end, um, because where else can it go? Now, if you're bleeding, that wouldn't be the case. But venous return, quantity of blood entering the right atrium per minute. Uh, Generally, venous return um, must equal cardiac output. In other words, the amount of blood coming back to the heart per minute has to be approximately equal to the amount of blood the heart is pumping out per minute, right? Otherwise, you have a backup. And you do get that in heart failure. You know, it backs up into the abdomen, for example. Now, what I don't want you to think is that this system is always in perfect balance, because it's not, okay? Um, venous return can exceed cardiac output or the other way around for a few beats a few minutes as things change but in general the amount in equals the amount out now we talked about frank starling already this is the way i prefer where where is it this one this is the way i prefer to think about it this guy is fs frank starling relationship um, and it's one of the ways that our heart has for matching supply and demand, right? In other words, you know, if I, if I give you an extra 500 cc's, well, that increases your EDV. I need the heart to pump that out more briskly, and it does so automatically, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so some of the causes of increased cardiac output, we've talked about some of these already. So increased heart rate, increased contractility. Um, increased venoconstriction, all right? So if we were going to add that to our list, it would go in here with venous return, right? Venoconstriction. Now you see why they make fun of my handwriting, right? So venoconstriction, if I constrict your veins, I push more blood towards your heart. That increases your venous return. See that? Um, so uh, increased venous venoconstriction. Increased total peripheral resistance um, will typically increase cardiac output, um, but can also reduce it, okay? So <clears throat> you're like, what the heck? All right, so total peripheral resistance, in, if I lower it, okay, for the same blood pressure, I'll increase the cardiac output. Do you see that? If I elevate TPR though, um, at some point, cardiac output has to go down, otherwise blood pressure would go up. So TPR's relationship is more complicated than just a simple increase. The parasympathetic nervous system um, causes, uh, inhibition causes increased heart rate. Oh, when we inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system, heart rate goes up. Hypertrophy. Um, in other words, if I make your heart work harder for a long time, in other words, I give you high blood pressure, let's say, um, <clears throat> or I make you very tall, <laughs> for example, um, well, that long-term increase in workload um, increases the mass and strength, and that works to increase um, stroke volume by making ESV smaller. So one of the changes you see in somebody who, let's say you are a cross country runner or you train for a marathon or whatever, is um, one of the benefits you get is your ESV gets smaller and smaller because your heart gets better and better able to completely empty. It gets stronger. By doing so, it gets more efficient. It can pump more blood for a given amount of energy and that's a good thing. So more stroke volume with each beat means a higher cardiac output for a given heart rate. So you can, this can have a large effect. So like if you um, uh, actively do aerobic training, you can increase your cardiac output by more than two and a half times normal. So like you really can train the heart. 
And then plasma volume. Anything that increases plasma volume will increase venous return. Another name for venous return is preload. All right, we talked about afterload, what you have to push against. Preload is what you have to push with, right? In other words, preload is what you got from the circulation, what the heart got from the circulation that it can use to push out. So the greater the venous return, the greater the preload. And so more venous return equals more stroke volume. So those are all things that increase cardiac output. And so what about some things that decrease it? Um, <clears throat> thank you. Increasing arterial pressure, <clears throat> particularly diastolic pressure, that's my, where is it, afterload component, right? Um, as diastolic blood pressure increases, there's, it's harder for the heart to push that valve open, so we get an increase in ESV and systolic volume. That then leads to a decrease in stroke volume um, and a decrease in cardiac output, which is what we're talking about. Blockade of the nervous system input. So remember that the sympathetic nervous system stimulates the heart's rate and contractility. So if we knock out the sympathetic nervous system, um, like we uh, showed in the, some of the dog examples, uh, we will end up with uh, a decrease in cardiac output because of a decrease in heart rate and a decrease in contractility both. Okay, so we need the sympathetic nervous system um, to uh, <clears throat> have optimal cardiac efficiency. Abnormal contractions or rhythms, all right? So the, you know, we talked early on about what we need for the heart to be efficient, you know, like the atria need to contract, the ventricles need to contract, and ideally the atria will contract together and the ventricles will contract together. Okay, well, that doesn't always happen. In abnormal rhythms, the conduction system is not coordinated, all right? So when the heart isn't beating in a coordinated way, cardiac output declines. This is essentially the cause of cardiac arrest, right? So if, um, let's say you have a myocardial infarction, the heart starts uh, twitching instead of beating. Well, that twitching contraction fibrillation has no real ejection, so cardiac output plummets. Okay, so in order to have a normal cardiac output, we need to have a normal rhythm. Now, when we get into, uh, when you, well, you'll see some of these in MedPath, um, some of the abnormal patterns that the heart can get into all have a tendency to decrease cardiac output. Even the ones that result in increased cardiac stimulation, you know, so like, uh, 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 superventricular tachycardia, for example, is uh, where the heart is beating way too fast, right? Well, the faster the heart beats, the lower the filling time, lower the EDV, or I'm sorry, um, yeah, smaller the EDV, less stroke volume, less cardiac output. So almost across the board, um, abnormal rhythms decrease cardiac output. Valvular disease. Remember, the valves are supposed to block reverse flow right? They're, that's their job. Well, as valves are damaged due to disease, okay, you can end up with valves that either regurgitate, in other words, allow blood to flow backwards, or stenose, have stenosis, which means that they restrict flow going through them. So either problem will reduce cardiac output, all right? So that's another area or cause and then myocarditis. So remember the heart is a muscle. And like all muscle, the muscle itself can get sick. It can have pathology. And in the heart, we call that myocarditis. When the heart, when the muscle cells themselves are not able to contract with their usual force. There are numerous causes of myocarditis, infectious, autoimmune, um, congenital, uh, but all of those decrease the strength of contraction. In other words, increases the ESV and reduces cardiac output. Now, um, the uh, myocarditis, valve disease, abnormal contractions, these are disease states, right? You know, that's not part of the normal physiology. Reduction in nervous system input and changes in arterial pressure, that is part of our normal physiology. 
right? So these things do decrease cardiac output, even in the healthy. This chart is the closest I can find to my alphabet soup, as I like to call it, um, that we talked about yesterday. All the things we talked about there are presented here. So if you weren't able to capture everything I put on the board and all the words I said, um, it's all here as well. And I'm gonna flip my mask around because it's like trying to uh, go down my throat. <laughs> which is not very comfortable. Okay, that's much better. Um, so you've got heart rate on one side, stroke volume on the other, right? Heart rate, stroke volume, and then each of these boxes talks about um, uh, changing those characteristics. So it kind of matches what I did here. I'm gonna skip it just because it's a repeat from what we talked about yesterday. Okay, so what's coming here in this slide set is a number of what I call flow diagrams, circle diagrams, or homeostasis diagrams. And what they are is they're putting in motion the different factors that we've talked about this week, okay? So, you know, we've talked about cardiac output, we've talked about total peripheral resistance, we've talked about many of the cardiac output factors. So let's put, let's tell some stories, right? So. What we have here is um, separating out the effect of autoregulation versus the effect of central regulation. All right, so let's start down here in autoregulation. Remember, this is happening at the level of the tissue, okay? So the nervous system is not involved here. We're taking already available blood pressure and using that blood pressure to create tissue flow, okay? So we start here at normal. If we have a, a homeostasis is disturbed, right? In other words, some change happened. Um, so that might be physical stress, that might be decreased oxygen or pH, increased CO2, increased tissue activity, all the things we talked about in autoregulation, signs of a busy tissue, right? Well, <clears throat> when a tissue has these characteristics, it's a sign that there's inadequate local blood flow the tissues aren't getting what they need. So the response to that is to decrease the resistance at the capillary bed and increase the blood flow. That increase in blood flow puts us back into homeostasis. Now the tissue is happy again, right? It has what it needs to continue to um, respond. So this is happening at the tissue level all the time. Now, what I said early on is, Autoregulation trumps everything else, but autoregulation depends on having an adequate systemic blood pressure. You know, the capillaries in your bicep can do nothing about increasing systemic blood pressure. They can only use the blood pressure that's already there. All right, so what happens if autoregulation is ineffective? Well, then we move to the central regulation systems, the organismal level. So we go from tissue up to organism. So when autoregulation is ineffective, um, you know, in other words, blood pressure isn't adequate to supply tissues with um, the blood flow that they need, we get effects to increase blood pressure. We have our neural effects that we talked about first. So the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors detect low blood pressure or increased metabolites. The cardiovascular center, the vasomotor center is activated and that activation of the vasomotor center causes an increase in sympathetic nervous system outflow. So we get an increase in total peripheral resistance and an increase in cardiac output. Both of those things work to increase blood pressure. That increase in blood pressure then allows autoregulation to restore adequate blood flow to the tissues that need it, okay? Now the nervous system mechanisms that we've talked about are fast, right? So seconds to minutes they can take place in. Um, so moment to moment blood pressure control, mostly on the sympathetic nervous system. We also have endocrine systems, right? Through the kidney, we have the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which is um, 
uh, which we'll talk again about in a second, but it's a system that both causes vasoconstriction as well as increased fluid retention, right? Because remember, the most likely cause for a low blood pressure is inadequate plasma volume, right? That's the most common thing that's gonna be the problem. So when the kidney is, is activated, we get a long-term increase in both blood volume and blood pressure that restores uh, or that increases our blood pressure and allows autoregulation to do their thing, right? So autoregulation is the much busier place. This is happening in different tissues all the time, but autoregulation depends on the central systems for keeping and maintaining a blood pressure that's adequate to do the job. Okay, so that's our first of our, our loop diagrams. <clears throat> so um, here, what we have is uh, how the baroreceptors are responding. Remember, the baroreceptors are the sensor, one of the two sensors, for the nervous system control of blood pressure. All right, so we start at the purple circle in the middle, and we'll go up first. So blood pressure goes up. Why? Could be any number of reasons, right? You know, you went from uh, standing to lying, for example, or you had, uh, um, you had the giant tub of popcorn that we talked about yesterday, right? Um, so your blood pressure goes up. Baroreceptors are going to be stimulated by that. They're going to increase their firing rate, and the brain will read that increase in firing rate as an increase in blood pressure. The response to that is going to be inhibition of the vasomotor center, right? So we'll have a reduction in cardiac output. We'll have vasodilation. Both of those things, so reducing TPR, reducing cardiac output, is going to reduce blood pressure. That restores our homeostasis. Do you see how this works? You know, the goal is the body is going to maintain its blood pressure by using these different systems to put things back the way they should be. Now, in the falling blood pressure side of things, um, this is actually the more common. We have a tendency to, to have blood pressure go down more often than up, right? Because we can't produce fluid in our vascular system. So um, <clears throat> if we have the case of falling blood pressure, now the baroreceptor output is going to be reduced right? We're going to have a slower output from the baroreceptors. Uh, the brain's going to respond to that. The vasomotor center will be stimulated by that reduction in baroreceptor input and we'll get um, cardio acceleration and, uh, well, we'll get activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So we'll have vasoconstriction and increased cardiac output. We'll increase this and this, right? that's gonna increase blood pressure and put us back to normal again. So this, these systems, these, this up and down, this is happening all the time. Every time you change positions, this is happening a little bit. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, some of you may have done a blood pressure lab in uh, undergrad where you sort of demonstrate this. You, know, you have somebody lay on the table for 15 minutes, you take their pulse and then have them stand up quickly what you see, um, so that's a falling blood pressure, right? And you can actually detect it. You get an increase in heart rate, that's cardio acceleration, and you get an increase in contractility. You'll not only feel the heart or the pulse increase, but it gets stronger for a moment. Then eventually that heart rate goes back down. Why? Because total peripheral resistance has clamped down on the vessels. Um, and elevated the blood pressure that way. So we end up back to our normal blood pressure with a normal heart rate. So these things are happening all the time, these regulatory systems. This is, again, nervous system, okay? This is nervous system control. We haven't gotten into the kidney bits at all in this uh, chart. All right, <clears throat> now, well, now we will. Now we'll get into the kidney bits too. All right, so here we are, homeostasis, blood pressure, blood volume, fall. Easiest way to talk about this is a hemorrhage, right? So <clears throat> you've lost some blood. 
Now, you're going to get short-term and long-term effects at the same time. The short-term effects we were literally just talking about, right? Sympathetic activation, reduction in barrel receptor output, increased cardiac output, and peripheral vasoconstriction. Okay, that we've already done. Well, what about the long-term bits? The long-term bits go through the kidney, okay? So when the kidney experiences low blood pressure, over a period of time, it responds by releasing renin, right? Renin brings about um, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 then has widespread vasoconstriction, um, release of aldosterone, release of antidiuretic hormone. It makes us thirsty. All of these things work to increase blood pressure and increase blood volume. So once the uh, kidney effects have taken hold, then the short-term nervous system effects can go back down, right? You know, they can reset because the original problem has been uh, created. Now, I am gonna add one more bit that I realize I haven't talked about yet, and that's um, <coughs> the kidney is the controller of how many red blood cells you have. All right, so not only does the kidney control your plasma volume through the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, but it also controls how many red cells you have in that plasma volume through the erythropoietin pathway. Okay, EPO, as we like to refer to it, is a hormone that stimulates the bone marrow to produce red blood cells and erythropoietin is released in response to low blood pressure and low oxygen availability, right? So, you know, remember our red cells, their job is to carry oxygen around. That's pretty much all they do. So if your oxygen level is low for days to weeks, your erythropoietin level will go up. You'll make more red cells to carry more oxygen around, right? So that's the mechanism, like if we were to uh, suddenly all move to Denver, right, our hemoglobin would slowly rise for the several weeks afterwards because the high elevation reduces oxygen availability, stimulates our erythropoietin to generate more red cells, right? So people in Denver literally have a higher hemoglobin than people in Omaha do, yeah. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway is considered a long-term control because it takes place over minutes to hours. Minutes to hours. Yeah. So then the short-term is seconds? The short-term is seconds to minutes, yep. Um, because remember, you've got nervous system which can, which can respond in less than a second on the one side. Endocrine makes bigger effects, but they take longer. So yeah, RAS, I consider a long-term control. All right, so um, yet another example. Okay, here is our less common example of an elevated blood pressure and blood volume. Um, now, in, in nature, in animals behaving normally, this doesn't happen very often because, you know, our thirst mechanism, we don't drink if we're not thirsty, right? Well, until you get to the human beings. Human beings do right? But animals don't. So <clears throat> this is a, a, the weirder case, but this is an example of when our blood pressure and blood volume are both too high. When might you have this? The classic example is we've given fluid to a patient, all right? So we've gone around their thirst mechanism and we've dumped a bunch of isotonic fluid into their um, vascular system. Okay, so we expand plasma volume. That increases venous return, right? So EDV starts to get very high, all right? That means the atria are getting stretched before contraction. That stretch triggers the release of the natriuretic peptides. The natriuretic peptides have multiple effects. One is to increase sodium loss in the urine. That's its name, right? Naturesis, sodium in the urine. That increase in sodium loss causes an increase in water loss, right? Water follows salt. We get a reduction in thirst, so we stop bringing in extra fluid. Uh, we inhibit ADH, aldosterone, epi, and norepi, 
all of these things tend to increase or, or maintain plasma volume, as well as increasing blood pressure, right? So if we drop all these down, we're gonna get a decrease in total peripheral resistance and cardiac output. And um, we'll have peripheral vasodilation. In other words, our TPR will go down. So all of those things are gonna reduce blood volume and reduce blood pressure, and that is gonna restore our homeostasis. Right? So <clears throat> I've talked to several of you about using the material that you're learning in the class. This is an example of that, right? You've learned about all kinds of factors and how they affect things. Physiology is about taking those factors and seeing how they behave in different scenarios, right? So that's kind of what these circle diagrams are setting up for you. All right, if this changes, what changes next? What changes next? And then how do we get back to homeostasis? So this is the excess blood volume um, case, which like I said, is the more rare of the two. Okay, well, what about the case of uh, intense exercise? All right, so when you go from sitting and listening in class to running up and down the stairs, let's say, okay, well, <clears throat> your, the homeostasis disturbance there is going to be an increase in CO2, a decrease in pH, and a decrease in oxygen levels, right? Because you're going to be increasing your metabolic work. So you'll make more waste products. You'll use more oxygen. So these changes are detected by the chemoreceptors, right? So aortic sinus, carotid sinus, uh, chemoreceptors. <clears throat> the response to elevated CO2, decreased pH, and oxygen, we're going to activate the vasomotor center, right? So that's going to increase cardiac output and blood pressure. We're also going to increase vasoconstriction. So exercise is going to increase your cardiac output and your total peripheral resistance. Those two things are going to increase blood pressure and provide more um, pressure to make flow in more parts of the body, right? Now, the added part that we get is respiratory stimulation. Um, and we'll talk about this in particular when we get to the respiratory system, but <clears throat> systemic high CO2, low oxygen, low pH stimulates the respiratory control centers to increase respiratory rate and depth. So not only are we increasing blood pressure and flow, but we're now bringing in more oxygen and getting rid of more CO2. Together, those things, increase cardiac output and increase respiratory drive, fixes the original problem, and we're back to homeostasis, even though we're now exercising, right? So we can still be in homeostasis even with a challenge. All right, so that's the exercise example. <coughs> the classic blood loss example, right? So here we are, homeostasis. We have some kind of extensive bleeding incident, okay? Well, what happens? The fastest responses are going to be in the nervous system branch, right? So baroreceptor and chemoceptor uh, stimulation, activation of the vasomotor center, peripheral vasoconstriction, so increased TPR, increased cardiac output. Now, all the while that's happening, we will also have our long-term controls activated. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a big hemorrhage is gonna result in decreased blood pressure, decreased glomerular filtration, therefore activation of the RAAS, right? That's gonna get us ADH, angiotensin II, aldosterone, and erythropoietin. Those things over um, hours to days are gonna elevate blood volume and also help to restore blood loss or uh, blood volume. So <clears throat> anytime we have a blood loss, we're gonna have these systems in play, okay? So, you know, where might we see that? Oh, like delivering a baby or surgery, right? Or post-trauma, all those, we're gonna have these systems in play. Now, shock is um, the 
is, is the final common endpoint of circulatory collapse. And essentially, the problem in shock is that you don't have enough plasma volume to generate the blood pressure you need to provide flow to the tissues, okay? So, um, you know, if we start up there at the top, you know, here's our <coughs> homeostatic failure in this case. <coughs> in other words, we've had a severe reduction in blood volume, in circulating blood volume. Now, this can be from hemorrhage, but it can also be from dehydration. You know, like you've had a diarrheal illness, so you've lost all your water into the toilet, right? Um, or it could be uh, plasma oncotic pressure. You don't have any plasma proteins, so all your fluids leaked out into your interstitial space and isn't circulating anymore, right? Like we see in nephrotic syndrome. So <clears throat> what we get there is we'll have a reduction in blood volume. Okay, that reduction in blood volume will lead to a reduction in cardiac output. Why? Because our EDV is gonna get smaller and smaller. See, because we have less and less blood circulating. The heart fills up less, so then it pumps out less, stroke volume goes down, so your cardiac output goes down. Now in shock, the body is still trying to, to do something about it. So one of the things it will do, it's gonna keep elevating your heart rate because that it can do. It can make your heart beat faster, but it can't make more fluid to circulate around, see? So one of the signs of shock is tachycardia um, because of that, it's this very uh, um, same response. So um, decreased cardiac output will have decreased arterial pressure decreased peripheral blood flow. All right, so now we have poor perfusion. Well, when we have poor perfusion, we're gonna have an increase in, in carbon dioxide and an increase in lactate. Lactate is one of our waste products. It's a way of getting rid of acid, as well as a decrease in pH. Now, when this gets really bad, the problem is we get two positive feedback loops. Remember, a positive feedback loop is where one change makes a bigger change, okay? A negative feedback loop is where a change turns something off. That's the one we see all the time. Positive feedback loop is a small change makes a big thing happen, okay? So <clears throat> when we have lots of tissues that are not being adequately perfused, our PCO2, lactate, and pH goes up, that triggers inflammation okay, because you've got sick cells, okay, inflammation triggers an increase in capillary permeability that reduces your blood volume, right, because now you've got fluid that's leaking out of your vessels into the third space, into the interstitial space where it's not useful. Also, increased PCO2 and lactate cause clotting within the vessels. That clotting further reduces peripheral blood flow and reduces venous return, which also decreases cardiac output, right? Then when your cardiac output gets bad enough, you have poor cardiac blood flow. So in other words, the heart isn't able to perfuse itself very well, okay? Now the heart muscle is starting to be damaged. It can't contract as well. So we get a decrease in cardiac output, you know, so this is another positive feedback loop. When the heart starts to get sick, it makes itself sicker. Do you see that? Because it can't supply itself with blood flow. So <clears throat> we have circling the drain, as we say, right? So we've got a bunch of things that are going wrong all at the same time. Now, the body's response to all of this decrease in arterial pressure is going to be to try to maximize vasoconstriction, right? So, and that's to try to elevate total peripheral resistance. The vasomotor center is going to be on fire trying to get as much vasoconstriction as possible. Now, the problem with that is as your TPR goes up, your diastolic blood pressure goes up. So, we start running into the afterload problem, right? that the heart is having to pump against massive resistance, that can cause muscle damage, which then further causes falling arterial pressure. Eventually, that your arterial blood pressure will be low enough that your central nervous system blood flow will start to go down, 
Okay, so now the vasomotor center isn't getting what it needs, and we start to get um, CNS damage, decreased sympathetic activity as the vasomotor center starts to die. All right, now we're into our, our another positive feedback loop. So our pressures keep going down and down, and we get circulatory collapse. So when we go to um, treat shock, we tend to focus on breaking the positive feedback loops, ideally up here in the blue region before we get down here to the purple region, right? So, you know, we, uh, we try to break this loop um, by uh, giving fluid to the patient, right? And stimulating cardiac um, activity with stuff like epinephrine. Um, <clears throat> we add oxygen to the patient to try to uh, uh, block off the increased capillary permeability from cell death all around the patient and to block the clotting problem. So this is shock, which is circulatory collapse essentially. So this is when the homeostasis mechanisms are unable to solve the problem right? Um, and patients do die of shock. It's, it's one of the things that, um, because sometimes there isn't anything you can do. If, if the inciting problem is something you can't solve relatively quickly, you, you may not be able to do anything for the patient. So, okay, cardiac output factors. Here we go. Heart rate goes from 100 to 200. How will EDV be affected? I guess I should erase my cheat sheet up here, huh? Ha ha. Not to worry, I can recreate it in about two minutes if I need to. All right. Yeah, we'll go down, okay? EDV is gonna go down. This is the filling time issue, right? Faster the heart rate, the less time the heart has to fill, less time it has to fill, less full it gets, okay? Oh, oh. you guys are quick. There's a widespread release of histamine and bradykinin in response to infection. Which of those is true? Oh, ho! all right. What does histamine and bradykinin do? Vasodilation, right? And they're nonspecific. In other words, this isn't nervous system. In other words, putting vasodilation where it wants it. This is going to be vasodilation wherever there's bradykinin and histamine, which is going to be everywhere. So we'll end up with a, a total peripheral resistance decrease and at least initially a blood pressure decrease. Now, the, the body will respond to that, but um, TPR would go down. A patient goes from lying to standing. Which of these will not result? Is will not result? Will not result. All right, um, let's see, you put cardiac output would be increased. So which of these will not result? If we go from lying to standing, um, <coughs> our total peripheral resistance will have to go up, right? Because we're gonna have a decrease in blood pressure. As the blood flows to your feet, your venous return is gonna drop off. So your cardiac output's gonna go down. And the body's response to that will be multiple. One is it's gonna increase the heart rate, but the long-term fix for going from lying to standing is increasing total peripheral resistance, right? You've gotta clamp down on the vessels so that you have higher pressure when you're standing. So it's uh, cardiac output would decrease when you go from lying to standing. All right, diastolic blood pressure increases from 80 to 120. 
how will ESV and SV be affected? I should give you more time on these, huh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right, so uh, this is the afterload issue, all right? So if we increase diastolic blood pressure, we increase the amount of work the heart has to do to open the valve, that's going to push up end systolic volume. When end systolic volume is higher, there's been less stroke volume, right? So we have ESV up, SV down. All right, there's one liter loss of blood. <clears throat> what will happen? Oh, choose all. Exciting. <laughs> Is it not letting you choose all? Ah, technology failure. <clears throat> all right, so, uh, yeah, well, they're, they're all correct, apparently, <laughs> except one. That's really weird. Okay. So what will happen as a result? Yes, the blood pressure will decrease, right? Because of a decrease in venous return. We'll get an increase in heart rate in response to that decrease in blood pressure. That's the vasomotor center, right? Um, we'll get an increase in total peripheral resistance because our blood pressure fell, right? So first we'll get a bump up in cardiac, then we'll get a bump up in TPR. Remember the cardiac effect can happen like really fast. The TPR effect takes 30 seconds to a minute. So what we see is we see fast effects in the heart first and then as TPR comes up, the heart rate goes back down, right? Um, the one that isn't there is uh, increase in barrel receptor output frequency. It would be the other way, right? It would be a decrease in barrel receptor output frequency because we'll have a decrease in blood pressure, okay? Sorry, that question was messed up. All right, last one for this section. At the beginning of exercise, the skeletal muscle pump increases venous return. What's the effect on ESV? On ESV. Yeah, good, decreases. Good. Um, <clears throat> why? So if we increase venous return, we're going to increase EDV, right? And the Frank Starling relationship says as EDV goes up, ESV goes down. So we have a decrease in ESV. Now, which way would stroke volume go? Up or down? Up, way up, right? Remember, Frank Starling is all about increasing stroke volume when a, in, we increase venous return. All right, woohoo. Let's see who won this one. The cute deer up from the, that was a big change too.